the Russian embassy uh, Twitter account did actually, um, when we opened our fake news exhibition, um, they took a photograph of a review of the exhibition, which was in the Daily Telegraph, um, and they posted it online, and they asked, um, well, you know, does the exhibition include the test tube that Colin Powell used to demonstrate the case for the Iraq war? And they, 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 that's real, that actually happened. You can, you can have a look at that online. Uh, and it, it tells you a couple of things. One, that international diplomacy is, in some respects on the internet has become a little bit strange. It also tells you everyone wants to be a curator. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, uh, we, we have various policies about who can decide what goes in our exhibitions. So we, we, um, we inform them of that. Um, so, Were you ever tempted to reply and say, like, yes, it does, it includes every single example ever, we've not curated <laughs> anything at all? <laughs> it's very specific, that particular example as well. It's yeah. an infinite room with everything in it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, you know, we're always, by the way, don't be put off by this. If you have ideas for things we should have in our exhibitions and galleries, or everyone is welcome, including the, the Russian embassy, to, to suggest things. Now, yes, can, Samira. Can I, can I just make an observation on, on the presentations I've had? The first thing I would say is the example you've given proves exactly what I was pointing out, that what trolls can do is it's just about knocking you off balance, mm. challenging the authority with which you put that exhibition together. It's so easy, and it sows the seed of doubt. That's why it's a real challenge. But the other thing which has really emerged from both your presentations, I have to confess, I've got a couple of bones to pick with Wikipedia, and I thought I'd just do it, is... Um, I can't change your article, sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> can I just say, it's so inaccurate, but um, I know that I'm not supposed to change my own. Right, you said, uh, you said nobody has an authority on what's the truth. Now, I fundamentally disagree. We might say that um, nobody should claim to have ultimate authority, but I think the reality is we need to know there are places we can trust. And I watched The Post the other day, the film about The Washington Post. And, mm -hmm. you know, going back to an age where there was a sense of responsibility about um, the role of, of big media organisations, I think, is really important. And I think it's dangerous to imply that the crowd can solve it. Mm. You also said there are no fake, there's no fake news on Wikipedia, but occasionally there are hoaxes. But, you know, uh, that could be arguably semantics. I think, you know, you said yourself that the representation of editors is overwhelmingly male and white. It doesn't reflect society. Women are missing in terms of the pages as well as editors. That's the same argument made against mainstream media organisations. Mm. Nothing is different. Everything is about curation. And when Facebook says, oh, we've come up with a new algorithm, which is going to solve this whole problem of fake news, you cannot engineer your way out of what is an issue of editorial choice and control. Mm. And you might still make mistakes, but having the guts, and I'm not locking you, I mean, to have this conversation <laughs> with Jimmy Wales, but, you know, people need to have the guts to say, you know what, we need people in there, we need to make sure they're, they have authority, that they're recruited to represent society at large, which means more women and more people from all kinds of backgrounds, um, and we need to accept we'll occasionally get things wrong, but we need to accept it requires people to make ethical mm. and value judgments. I'm going to pick up on, on that, sorry. Um, it was, it was, so one of the things I always find quite an interesting uh, or kind of idea of application is the algorithmic problem, mm -hmm. kind of the, the bot problem, where it's like, Algorithms are not neutral. There has never been a. There's, there's nothing about an algorithm or a process that is neutral. It's very much. It's kind of human prejudice, human action. Everything that is written is kind of pulled through that system. And it's it was interesting, kind of that how like how you solve it, but how you actually put that. Like, I'm, and I am very wary of the problem. Like, not everyone can be a curator, and that's not just my curator's tyranny coming out. But it's the idea of like kind of again proper training and like, how do you allow people to kind of have those critical skills, allow them to be good at, at that. And I'm, I always worry with things like Wikipedia when I see things like the like, creation of bots or bots being used. There are so much things like language databases that, that exclude certain people or certain phrases, which means that actually you, you are still having that problem. And like, I guess that's why I worry when people say, oh, we, we've trained this AI or this trained thing on, on a database, but you don't know what's been excluded and pulled in. And what's to say that those bots with the vandalism actually isn't removing like an LGBT kind of well, it's teenagers like group? That's exactly, or breastfeeding images are taken yeah, on Facebook, but pornography is still up there. And I'll give you one other quote of your own words. We will be, um, yes. Yeah. So the, the way that this will work uh, is we're going to have a little bit of a chat and then uh, we're going to open up to questions. And I suppose just to reassert at the beginning, we've got three representatives essentially from uh, different institutions, which I think my, my gut feeling is all of whom have a level of responsibility uh, in this context. Um, 
And just before we go to John, because I think it's fair that John oh, gets a chance to come back, yeah. um, just this language of uh, bots, are people familiar with that? It basically means, yeah, if people are not familiar with that, um, there are quite often online uh, computer programs, basically, that check things automatically. So instead of things being checked um, by uh, people, there are also computer programs that do that and do other kinds of actions. So if people are not f haven't come across that, that's, you know, it's a relatively new term. John, just on that I'll, I'll one very, point. I'll be, yeah. be very brief. Go for it. I, I, I don't dis disagree with. I, mm. I think that um, maybe um, I, perhaps I should have made myself more clear by saying that I don't. I, I agree with you. I don't think that, that anybody has ultimate authority. I don't mean there should be no authority. And I think what I was trying to um, kind of get across is that there is quite a lot of curation on, on Wikipedia, and it's not. Uh, the wild west that people think it is generally mm. no and i totally agree but i think you did also say it isn't our job to be editorially decisive i would say there are facts which are indisputable there's facts there's opinion there's analysis and there are falsehoods and the gap between facts and opinion and analysis is quite significant i mean mm. so i mean the, the point that you made in the beginning that i didn't that i don't think we particularly touched on is how how much um how much do we should we be um activists in, in how in how we deal with these problems and personally i think that um Although we don't control the content on Wikipedia, we, we as the charities should be um, should be thinking of ourselves as activists in, in a certain way because we recognise that there are problems in terms of the representation of women, mm. people of colour on, on, on our platforms and it's our responsibility to change that because it's that's that's part of our ethos. So jo I, I do think we have that responsibility. John, I'm going to bring uh, Gabor in in one second but um, just... I suppose, just for people's uh, benefit, the real reason we, we invited John here as representative of Wikimedia is there is a little bit of a sense of deja vu. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, everybody was in fear that, um, you know, encyclopedias, we can't trust encyclopedias anymore. Mm. We can't trust anything written online. And Wikimedia and also, you know, Wikipedia um, more generally have, you know, fought this kind of battle before. You've introduced all kinds of principles mm to try to, if not make sure that things are totally correct, um, to make sure that people can see behind the scenes. Citations. I yeah. tell students all the time about the brilliance of citations on Wikipedia. Mm. Your point about you know, the impartiality of this article has been disputed. Mm. You're right. These are things which I wish more mainstream organisations mm. news would do. So just, uh, I'm conscious we, we will be moving to, a, to an open Q&A, um, but we, we sort of finished on international diplomacy and we were sort of saying, well, we've moved into a little bit of a weird space online. Um, I'm not sure if this museum's had many sort of jokey interactions with, uh, with international embassies before, that, that was new to us. Is this uh, new territory? It is fairly new ter territory that's um, authoritarians trying to be funny. And um, but it's effective. <laughs> yeah. It's effective. It has mm. to be said. Um, joke was not something which in totalitarian regimes operated with. Mm. And the other thing is that, of course, people who lived in totalitarian regimes, they were quite alert. When they, you know, they were trained to read between the lines in mm. the newspapers. They knew how to deal with falsehoods. They, I wonder if you could say more about that. I interviewed a Polish dissident who worked on the underground press, and he said there was the level of trust you had between other people involved in your cells. You had to smuggle papers hidden down his pants. There was a real fear. But as you say, this, they knew that what they were being told officially was a lie. And I think we've, so many people don't have yeah. that memory. But because everyone knew that every government problem, you know, book, newspaper, whatever published, contained a big lie. OK? So mm -hmm. once you have that mindset, Mm. Then you actually look for the truth there. And it's very funny. A, a lot of uh, former journalists in yeah. Russia complain that, oh, very factual journalism, like, like if they never had a lie in their How life. How did but you of deal course, with it? Because, because if there's a general lie, then you know, it's much easier to be factual. The reader knows that there is a lie, so I'm looking for, you know, for example, you discount the first sentence and the last. It was known as the red tail. Oh. You know, we, you know they, they always put there a kind of little sentence which made it tolerable for the regime. Uh, you always looked at the, the beginning of an article, you, you picked on certain subjects. Yeah, that's the journalist speaking. Mm. Yes, that's the regime speaking. And we're not talking about media buffs or people you had mm. training, you know, how to be a good journalist and how to do this. We're talking about ordinary people, you know, who had this because, and in fact, you have the choice. Should I pay, um, get an illegal opposition paper or get a party paper? Most people went for the most blatant propaganda, very easy to dissect. The, the, there's a very good, this, um, this whole debate kind of reminds me, there's a very, very good 
line at the end of um, Yuval Harari's book Homo Deus, which is a fantastic book that I think also everybody should read about around this subject, where he says that in the past um, censorship worked by restricting access to information, whereas now there's so much information that censorship almost works by bombarding you with so yes. with, with so much information you can't tell um, the the truth from the fall. But from that's the, that's the, the point. The trust which is going entirely. And the, the the other thing this reminds me of a lot. But is it only bothers you if you assume that you need to trust the source. If right. you know you don't <laughs> trust the source, you have a critical mindset in, straight um, away. In the West, because you live in a democracy, you assume that we, I'm not going to be fed. So we're more vulnerable. We totally, much more Are so. there yeah. lessons that you could give us, having lived through that in Hungary, for how we should approach the world we're in? Well, I mean, it comes back to that the defence has to come from the individual. You know, there's no legal defence, there's no technological defence against posting such things. Mm. But the individual have to know when there is a lie, when, when, you, when you see a lie, and, and you have to assess critical... And, you know... Critical thinking. If you're forced into critical thinking, whether you like it or not, whether that's mm. your disposition, that's one thing. If, if you're not, you have to learn to be more critical. That, mm. That's about it. Uh, Hannah Arendt said that the ideal subject of totalitarianism is not the convinced fascist or the convinced communist, but somebody who can't tell truth from false anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We we were going to recite that at the very beginning, actually, because you know this is all very jokey, but actually there are quite significant things at stake mm. uh, here. You know, if people can't distinguish fact and fiction, they can't distinguish true and false. True and false, then they're mm. very, very able to be manipulated. Um, mm. So on that heavy tone um, uh, or, of where we might be going, um, I'm just wondering. We've again, we've got some representatives of really key institutions who invest a lot in fact and in truth uh, before us. Um, Kate, who is up here, Kate is our creative producer who put this event together, so uh, thank you to Kate for that. Um, Kate is going to pass this microphone. Uh, can I just, while you're finding the first question, just if you haven't already seen it, it's a big story in the front of all today's <laughs> papers, that research by the Edelman Foundation, 33,000 people worldwide, into fake news, and that people trust all news outlets much less now. As a, a, and that's a direct impact. So there is literally a diminished yes. sense of trust. And that's for us as, a, as an institution concerned with fact and, and um, concerned with uh, historical fact and things like that. Then there's a risk to our institution and to Natalie's institution uh, of museums. Um, so if people could put their hands up, I'm going to pick a few questions. Um, so if we could go uh, one, and then if we could go two and three, and if we could just take those questions and try to um, bring them together.